Hi everyone, welcome back. So today I have a very special guest with us. Her name is Mariah Jackson and she's here and she's gonna to talk to us about all things priesthood, the tabernacle. This is a really interesting and revelatory topic and you're gonna to love this topic. She has a she is a prophet and she has a lot of revelation regarding this from God and she's gonna be teaching us today and I'm so excited for this. Welcome Mariah, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually really, really excited about this. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, I think probably just for, for one, um, I connect to it a lot. Um, for those that don't really know um, me or just to kind of introduce myself, uh, I am what people would consider a Messianic Jew. Um, my father actually is a descendant from the tribe of Levi. So we actually come from the priestly bloodline. Um, so after doing a lot of digging and God just talking to me about my own personal call, anointing, different things like that, uh, it really showed me how much God intended for us to walk in this like priestly anointing and understanding who we are as priests, according to scripture, um, and different things like that. So when you reached out and asked me uh, about this topic, I was just like, okay, God, I know for a fact this is you, because <laughs> I was just, you know, just really going over this and studying it. So I'm really excited to share it with you all. Um, so to, well, before we even before I even jump right into it, uh, I'm just going to take a moment and just start us off with prayer uh, before I go into the teaching. Lord, first, we want to thank you for just allowing us to wake up today. We thank you for being so awesome, for being so holy, for being so righteous, and yet still loving us, still extending grace, and still extending mercy, regardless of the fact that we do not deserve it. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. We pray that you, we, we, we repent for anything we may have thought, said, or done that was not pleasing to you. I repent for anything I may have done that was not pleasing to you so that I'm able to serve your people with clean hands, God. I pray that you would give me wisdom and direction and guidance on what to say and how to say it. I pray that you will open up the ears of the viewers and the listeners so that they're able to receive everything that you have for them. I pray that you will guide their walk, that you will guide their thoughts, their actions, so that everything that they do is in alignment with you and your perfect will for their life. I pray that this teaching inspires, that it encourages, that it empowers, and that after people watch this, they go out into the world being ambassadors for you as you have called them to be in Jesus name we pray amen 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 all right all right and now Mariah is going to teach us so I'm really excited I felt the Holy Spirit as she was praying so I know the Lord is here and many eyes will be open today in Jesus name praise God all right so um, as you can see, we are going to be talking about the posture of priesthood. And so God, going through this, God was basically um, showing me that a lot of people within the body, a lot of followers of Christ don't actually understand the transition that took place during priesthood. And so when we talk about the priesthood, when we talk about priests, Aaron, Moses, um, you know, just, just that whole thing from the Old Testament, a lot of people tend to overlook it and they kind of bypass it because it's Old Testament. I found out that too many believers think that things from the Old Testament are completely irrelevant to what we do today as believers. And that's simply not true. We cannot fully understand who Jesus is what he did for us or who he has called us or even enabled us to be empowered us to be if we do not study the old testament in its fullness so as you can see right here just as a visual um on this side okay you can't see my mouse on this side we have um this is like a representation of the high priest in the old testament this is what aaron would have worn um people that the high priest that came after him and then transitioning over, this is a representation. I'm saying representation because I know some people are like, oh, that's not Jesus. It's a representation of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so I will be explaining how that transition took place and how it also affects you as a believer. Okay. So we're going to start with the Levitical priesthood. 
Now, a few points that I want to make regarding the Levitical priesthood. Um, it was established by God through Aaron, Moses, and the tribe of Levi. Remember, Aaron and Moses were brothers. They both came from the tribe of Levi. Moses was basically ordained to be the leader um, to Israel. Aaron was ordained to be the high priest to Israel. Um, and so we'll go into that in a bit. Um, it was divided into three main subgroups, which a lot of people don't know. We'll go over that as well. They were responsible for helping to lead the people in communion with God. Keep that in mind because we're going to go over that more. Um, but with the responsibility of helping people to commune with God, they were basically uh, mediators to help. Because remember, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they were not Israelites yet, technically. They were considered Hebrews. They still are considered Hebrew. But before God encountered Moses, um, before Moses was, you know, doing what he was doing and really understood who he was, different things like that. Um, there was a gap between, you know, Adam and Eve and uh, Noah and all the, there, there was like 400 years of slavery that was going on where the Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians. During this time, they were actually polytheists. So they were worshiping multiple deities and multiple gods until God introduced himself to Moses. That's why when he spoke to Moses, Moses said, well, who should I tell them sent me? Moses didn't know who God was like that at the time. So that's what God said, tell them I am has sent you. And they only knew God as the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, but they had no real personal intimate relationship with God apart from that. And so God would use the Levites or the, the priestly line to help people understand who God is, how to worship him, what his heart enjoys, what he doesn't like, what he won't tolerate, different things like that. Um, and they also taught the laws and statutes of God. So as I was saying, you know, what God is okay with, what he's not okay with. And they understood the times and signs of God. So people, God would talk to them and say, you know, during the new moon, do this. In fact, one of the first things that God did when he brought them out of Egypt was establish Passover. And he told them, he said, um, during the new moon, he said, this is going to be the beginning of the month for you. And this is what I want you to do during this time every year. You're going to do this as a memorial for Passover so that you can remember that I brought you out of Egypt, different things like that. So he taught them about the new moon. He taught them about the full moon. He taught them how to read the, 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 the signs in the heavens. People forget that God created the heavens. He created the moon. The Bible said that he created the moon to tell us about time and seasons right and so because of that they had to under that's how god's clock works god works on a lunar calendar that's why he would always talk about the moon and have them observing the moon in this picture we see the shofar the uh in the book of psalms it says blow the trumpet that's the shofar at the new moon and at the full moon the levites had to understand that because that was part of god's timing that was part of their mandate was to understand the times and seasons of god so that they can be on one accord with him mm -hmm. now the three subcategories of the levitical tribe you had the priests you had the Levites and you had the high priest. Um, people use interchangeable names for the Levites. Um, I'll go into that in a second. But these were the three main groups that you would see coming from this tribe of people that God called for. Also, um, just to make it and something I find really interesting before I even go to that part. If we look back in Genesis... Um, the tribe of Levi was started by Levi, which is one of the sons of Jacob. Levi, and I believe it was Judah, were actually known to be a little temperamental, and they were known to be a little violent. Um, but even with that, God, and I find this so fascinating because God used that the struggle of the forefather 
to actually pull them closer to himself. And so Levi, the founding father of the Levitical tribe, like I said, he wrestled with anger, being temperamental, different things like that. And then fast forward, after they, after the uh, Hebrews, Hebrews, so Moses goes up the mountain, he's talking to God, the Hebrews are pretty much impatient. They create this idol out of gold, right? And so God becomes angry, Moses becomes angry, Moses comes down from the mountain and basically says, who's going to be on God's side? Who's going to choose to serve God? The people that stepped forward and said, we're going to choose to serve God, ended up being the Levites. So then Moses kind of tests them, and he says, well, if you're really choosing to be on God's side, basically wipe out anyone from this camp who refuses to follow the mandates of God and decides that they're going to keep their own guys. The Levites ended up, I think, taking out, I'm, I'm saying taking out to be very nice, but he, as social media would say, unalive them. <laughs> the, the Levites unalived about 3,000 people that were in the camp and refused to follow God's will out of impatience or reluctance or a slave, a slave mentality, different things like that. The Levites were able to do that. Why? Because it goes back to Levi and the issue he had. But even though it was an issue for Levi, it became a strength for the Levites when it came time for this. And I always tell people, sometimes your struggle is an indication of what you're able to do. I say drug dealers, yeah, what they're doing is bad, but they're probably good with business. Psychics, they're not supposed to be telling the future, but they're probably called to the prophetic. Levi had an anger problem, but that's because his line was called to be uh, almost militant when it comes to serving God. And so that's where that came in handy and how the Levites became chosen for this purpose. They already had ties before that, but this is where it became official. Now, um, to go through the different types. Um, so as I was saying, with the third group, that the name is kind of interchangeable. Um, so this is, I don't want to butcher the name, but <laughs> this is um, the Hebrew name that was given for the, you. I guess you could say like the lower rank, because th these were ranks, the, the lowest ranking from the, the tribe of Levi. And their work was to assist the Levites with temple work. They did tasks like wood cutting, water carrying, um, they were known as temple servants. So if you sometimes you'll see in the Bible where there's people in like idolatrous temples that are known as temple servants and they're there to, you know, maybe they'll have female temple servants who are there to sexually gratify men that are coming in that temple to worship that deity. Um, there was a lot of prostitution that would go on um, with temple servants, with other deities and other gods. But with this, with Yahweh, the true God, the temple servants were responsible for helping with the manual labor that was required to set up the different items that were within the temple. So you had the menorah, you had the Ark of the Covenant, you had all this furniture. Someone had to put it together. Someone had to do the manual work. And so that is where this group came in, which it was an honor because they were serving God and they understood that. And so it's also a very strong possibility that this group is not genetically from the tribe of Levi, but that instead, this is one theory that people have, is that they were actually grafted in after being defeated by Joshua um, in the war, because war. you don't really hear about them until after Joshua defeats the, the, the Gibeonites. You don't see them until after Joshua conquers them, and it says mm -hmm. that he basically kind of formed an alliance with them and grafted them in because they were willing to work as opposed to being taken out, basically. Mm -hmm. And so then you have the next group, which is the priests or the Levites, um, and they assisted the high priest. They're, so their assistance was or this group over here, and they the priests were assistants to the high priest. And so they assisted the high priest. They were descendants of the tribe of Levi. They were everything from temple musicians, gatekeepers, judges, temple officials, craftsmen, guards, and they sustained and provide they were sustained and provided for by God and his people. I think that's one thing that people don't really want to touch. And people say, well, pastors shouldn't be living off of the congregation or leaders shouldn't be making money off the people that they're serving. 
That's not actually true. It has always been the will of God for his servants that are leading a lot of people and putting a lot of time and effort and energy into serving his people. It was always God's will for those people to help sustain the priests, the pastors, the prophets, all these people, because God knows how laborsome and how much work this takes. This also helps people to be honorable and respectful to those God has assigned over them. It's not a matter of leaders being, you know, money hungry or power hungry or anything like that, but God honors those that he places in leadership why because he's the one that put them there and he expects his people to have the same standard we're so used to you know preachers that are in it for the wrong reason maybe they are money hungry but that doesn't mean that every single leader is so we have to stop punishing leaders who are asking you to sow a seed for their ministry or asking you to sow a seed you know it's not going to kill you to do that you should be sowing the seed into good soil and that is how the priest people would, would bring things to the temple to present to god and a portion of it would go to the priest as god himself ordained god wanted the, and he, god would even tell them in scripture there's one passage of scripture i don't have it in here um but i know it a lot of people haven't read it but there's one passage i believe in in it's either leviticus or numbers i believe where god is talking to the levites and he says you know um basically the money that you make from serving in my house and in my temple take it buy whatever you want with it. you can even buy wine with it if you want to and but whatever food you want get it for yourself get it from your family consume it in front of me sit before me and just eat and drink and be merry be happy enjoy yourself you deserve it basically for all the work that you've been putting in i want you to sit in my presence and i want you to find rest I want you to enjoy. I want you to live life with your family and be happy in my presence. That's something that a lot of people miss that started in the priesthood. Well, and then we also have the high priest. Now the high priest, um, the, the, how the high priest was selected, these were direct descendants of Aaron. The priests were typically um, other Levites and then the high priests were direct descendants of Aaron. Um, they performed that these are the ones who performed the actual sacrifices they led worship offered atonement for sins they were the intercessor between god and the people they couldn't have physical defects and they had to be holy in conduct 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 sorry typo um they were allowed to wear the urim and thummim. so to kind of break that down for us a lot of people don't know what that is in the first picture that i showed um with the picture of the two priests I don't know if, if you were paying attention or not you, but people in general, if you guys are paying attention or not, but there was a breastplate that both the high priest and Jesus were wearing in the pictures. Um, so in the ancient Israel times, um, and even past that, this was a practice that went on even in the New Testament, um, underneath the ephod was a pocket. Uh, that was in, sewn into the material. And within that pocket were two stones. Um, it's believed that one was black and one was light. I mean, white. And it one means perfection. The other one means uh, light. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do, they would come to the high priest and they would ask the question. It could be maybe, you know, should we go to battle? Or does God want us to do this? Or does he want us to do that? Which route should we take? Different mm -hmm. things like that. And the priest would open it up and reach inside that pocket and whichever stone he pulled out, that there was also Hebrew written on it. That would determine what God's will was. God would speak through those stones. Um, another belief, this is, I, I'm leaning more towards this one, is that the stones actually lit up. And when they would light up, they would basically tell what God's will was for that person. But only the high priest was able to do that. The place where we see an exception, well, at the time, only the high priest could do that. But we also see other people doing this in scripture, and people just don't really catch it. So in Proverbs, it says that every lot basically comes from the Lord. So showing us that casting lots is a part of God's will. People say it's divination. You know, people say it's divination, but literally, Proverbs says this is from God. 
um, in the book of Jonah, mm -hmm. when Jonah was running from God and he was on the boat and this big storm came, they were trying to figure out why is God so mad at us that this storm is coming? So they cast lots and it says the lot fell in the lap of Jonah. And that's so what they knew. That's what made them toss Jonah overboard is that the lot told on him in the book of Acts. Yes, New Testament in the book of Acts. When they're trying to figure out who the next disciple would be that would fill in the place for Judas, they cast lots to figure out who the next disciple would be. So we can't say it was only an Old Testament thing because this happened in the book of Acts. We are still living in the book of Acts. That's why it's one. It's the only book that is not actually closed out. There is no end to the book of Acts because we're still living in it. Um, so, yeah, so they were able to use the Urim and the Thummim. They would communicate with God, let people know what is God saying. Um, even in the Old Testament, if a man thought that his wife was cheating on him, he would take his wife before the high priest. The high priest would put together um, dust off the temple floor, mix it with water, have her drink it. If she drinks it and something bad happens to her, it's because she was committing adultery. If nothing bad happens to her, it's because she wasn't. She was a faithful wife, but they had to go to the high priest to make that happen. That's how responsible he was for just a lot of different things. And then also he was a political figure. So people had kings. It was actually never really God's will for Israel to have a king. Um, it was supposed to be the high priest that was giving them orders and telling them what God wants. But because they wanted a king so bad, God gave them what they wanted. They ended up with Saul. You know how that went. And they <laughs> just continued to go down from there. <laughs> right. Um, but originally, it was supposed to be the high priest that was the political figure for Israel. Okay. And now we can talk about high priest sacrifices. This is from Leviticus 16. Yes, Leviticus 16. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's like the whole chapter and I don't want to like just sit here and read the whole chapter. But I encourage you all to read it on your own time. But just to give... A brief summary, this is talking about, um, this is God giving Aaron instructions on how to make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel or the, the Hebrews at the time. And so basically what he's telling them, um, he's telling Aaron, he's telling Aaron that, um, let me go right here. He's telling Aaron, he says, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. That's how serious it was in the Holy of Holies, which is the, the innermost part of the temple where God's presence was dwelling. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take the congregation, take from the congregation of the people of Israel, two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So I'm going to stop right there. So basically for atonement, the high priest, there's a lot of pressure on the high priest, but the high priest would have to go through all these different things, wear these certain clothing, bathe, make sure that he's, you know, purified, that he's clean. He's on in right standing with God. He had to go through all those things. And so then um, during the atonement, which is about once a year, um, he would get two goats and what they would actually, this is uh, rabbis teach this too. There would be um, two, there would be three red strings, one tied to the horn of one goat, one tied around the neck of the other goat, and then one was tied to the handle of the door of the temple or tabernacle, um, depending on what time period you're in, but it would be tied to the door of that as well. And so what they would do is that Aaron would place his hand, well, they would cast lots first to decide which goat would be for this, for the sin offering and which one would be for God. So after casting lots, God will let them know which one is for which. And the one that was for sin, 
um, would basically be brought into the wilderness. It will be released into the wilderness. And it says for Azazel. People have asked me, what does that mean? So in Hebrew, Azazel actually means wilderness. Um, and so that means that that's the one that's assigned to be sent into the wilderness. It also is the name of a fallen angel. According to the book of Enoch, it's one of the fallen angels that was responsible for for procreating with human women, as well as introducing humans to things that they weren't supposed to have yet, such as weapons, such as war. Is war itself bad or are weapons bad? No, there are weapons in heaven, but they were showing a corrupt or perverted way to do this. And Azazel was responsible, was one of the ones responsible for that. And so I personally believe that one of the reasons why the goat had to be sent into the wilderness for Azazel is that the goat is actually spiritually acting as a testimony against this fallen angel because at the end the bible says that even the fallen angels will be judged and we'll be judging them we will have to judge angels after everything is said and done and so the sins being of, of the people being sent into the wilderness is a tact or a testimony against this fallen angel and all the things that he's kind of um, introduce guys, well, not guys, but people in general, humanity to, mm -hmm. and different things of that nature. So the goat would be released into the wilderness, and it would kind of get to like the edge of this cliff, and they would push the goat off of the cliff, yes. and this goat would be let go. It was more than likely was killed or extremely injured or something like that. And according to rabbis, when this would happen, every time atonement would take place, the scarlet thread that was on the goat and on the temple of the door would go from red to white. Wow. It would change colors. And this actually makes me think of Isaiah, the scripture in Isaiah that talks about though our sins be, you know, red as crimson, that through basically there will be a purification and that it will be will become white as snow. It will become white as snow. That is a reference to the string that would change color when atonement took place. Wow. And how that was basically God letting them know that he accepted their offering. He accepted their atonement. It's, the atonement's been made and they are in right standing with God for another year. And this is what Aaron had to do. So, like I said, that's probably a lot of pressure. <laughs> and so it also talks about um, it also talks about Aaron using incense, which is what God wanted. Incense were, are also in heaven. So everything that God told Aaron to do, these were a replica, according to Hebrews, of things that are already in heaven. So God was establishing a home amongst his people on earth. He's already in heaven, but he wanted to be able to dwell among his people because he loves us so much. He wanted to be able to, to dwell among us, to be among us, that we can approach him. We can have a relationship with him, at least in the way that they could at that time. Um, and so he had Moses and Aaron to set up this tabernacle or this temple up in the model of what's in heaven so that God would feel at home, they would have a taste of heaven, and that they would be able to really, really honor and revere God the way that he's supposed to be. And so there's incense in heaven, um, according to scripture and in Revelation, our prayers are like incense to God. I also believe that the incense were necessary to cover up the smell of sacrificed animals, of burnt mm -hmm. offerings, um, according to um, uh, documents on the ancient Israelites, they were actually known for having a pleasant aroma coming from their camp. They were known for having this really, really just fragrant, beautiful mm -hmm. aroma that would come from their camp. And um, when people were in the tabernacle or the temple or in the area, it would the, the smell or the smoke would latch onto their clothes. They would take it home with them. The, home, the smell will be in their homes and that will be them carrying a reminder of the presence and the glory of God to their families because it smells so wonderful. It smells so glorious. And now they're able to take that home. And you know, you have that nostalgic feeling. Maybe you'll smell an old perfume or some cookies or just something from your childhood. When you smell it, you go, wow, like your mind goes back to that place. This was a form of nostalgia for them that God was establishing where they can smell those incense on their clothes, in their blankets, and remember how wonderful God is and what he brought them from and things of that nature. Yeah. This is, well, this is a continuation 
of the the atonement and what he had to do. So Aaron, after Aaron would also kill an animal for atonement, he would take the blood of that animal. He would go before God after going through all the process. And so then you have the Ark of the Covenant. And on, oh, I'm sorry, did you say something? No. Oh, um, so on the Ark of the Covenant, there was, it was almost like a plate that's in the, the top middle of the Ark of the Covenant that is known as the mercy seat. That is where God's presence would dwell. Sometimes they would see a cloud hovering over the mercy seat. And that would represent God's presence being there. They would take the blood of the animal uh, and use a either their finger or they would use a branch from a plant. And they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, I believe, seven times. And that would show that blood had been shed for the remission of sins and the atonement would be accepted and they would be in right standing. And they were able to basically take that breath until the next year. Wow. Let's see. Okay, so this is a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the plate isn't necessarily on here, but it would be right in this area between the wings of the two angels. That is where the mercy seat would be. And that is where they would sprinkle the blood um, to cover the atonement for sins. Now, um, we're going to go to the next priestly order now that we've gone over the Levites and just kind of what they had to do, um, the things that God demanded, things like that. And now we have the order of Melchizedek. A lot of people are not really familiar with him because he's not someone that is spoken of in great detail in scripture. A lot of people miss it. It's not like the story of David or... Mm -hmm. You know, Samson or Abraham were like these more well-known people in the Bible. But Melchizedek plays a huge role. So where we first see him is in Genesis 14. Um, and it says, after his return from the defeat of, I do not want to butcher that word. <laughs> and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba or the king's valley. Then and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Ab Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went who went with me. Let Ener, Estro, and Mamre take take their share. So to kind of break this down, Abraham, he's not even Abraham yet, he's still Abram. But he basically went into battle with you know, people in Sodom, defeated them. The king of Sodom comes out and he's talking to them. Um, while all this is going on, Melchizedek just pops up out of nowhere. And it says that he's the king of Salem. Just to point this out, Salem is actually Jerusalem. Um, it was known as Salem at first, but now we know it as Jerusalem. So this was the king of Jerusalem at the time before we even know what it is. Um, and so he comes out and he brings bread and wine um, and he blessed Abram. And it says that Abram gave him a tenth or a tithe to Melchizedek. Mind you, the law doesn't exist yet. OK, the law doesn't exist. The priesthood has not been established yet. Yet we have this priest here who is from God and we have no idea where he came from. And then we also have these scripture references as well. We have Psalm 110, three through four. And it says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. 
Now, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel who are descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who was blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the one who collect the tithe, pay a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid, the, paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of Levi on which the law was based could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the, the order of Levi and Aaron? And if the priesthood is changed, the law also must be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have, not, have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. And Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. So to kind of break this down, I know it's it's quite a bit, but basically what this is saying and what's being said in Hebrew, what the author of Hebrews is saying is that Melchizedek shows up. He has no, no recorded genealogy. We don't know where he came from, but we know he's obviously not a descendant of Levi because Levi wasn't even born yet. Right. So mm -hmm. comes before them, Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek, which shows that Melchizedek must be higher or greater than Abraham if Abraham tithes to him. Right. And so mm -hmm. that is what's being pointed out right here. And it's, and then it goes on to say, well, if this happened and Melchizedek gave them a blessing, it will almost be like Levi tithed to Melchizedek because he was inside of Abraham's body. When Abraham gave the tithe, this is also where generational curses and generational mm -hmm. blessings come in. People say, well, how can a generational curse exist? Because you exist inside the body of your parents wow. and your ancestors before you're even conceived. You're in there as, you know, part of their body. And so what they do at that time can have an effect on you. Levi was credited with giving tithes to Melchizedek because Abraham did it first. Abraham wasn't even his father. That was like his grandfather or great grandfather. Um, yeah, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so he still got a blessing for that, even though he was not physically there to actually be able to do it. And so this is going on. And so the author goes on to say, um, basically pointing out how odd it can look yeah. when Melchizedek was considered a priest and he does not come from Levi and then this new priest comes and this new priest is also not from the tribe of Levi. In fact, he's from the tribe of Judah. There's no indication um, from Aaron that another priest would arise from the tribe of Judah, but that's what ends up happening. And so the, the, pre the high priest that comes from the tribe of Judah is in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Aaron and the Levites because he does not come from that tribe. So it's a new order, but it also came before Abraham, which takes me to the, the saying um, where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Wow. Melchizedek is a representation or a Christophany which is kind of like a foreshadow in the Old Testament before Jesus walked the earth as a man. Melchizedek is a Christophany of Jesus Christ. He is a foreshadow or a, a, a representation of Jesus Christ himself who became our high priest. So now um, here are a few points to just kind of point out about Melchizedek and what happens. Um, so like I said, he appears after Abraham wins in battle. Um, Melchizedek was both priest and king, which is kind of unheard of to be priest and king. He was the king of Salem, but he was also a priest unto God. Does not happen. 
The only other person that really happened with was who? Jesus. <laughs> In fact, another actually another place we see a Christophany is actually with King David. So if you look in the book of Psalms, some of the things that David wrote, he was writing as if it was happening from first person perspective, but he was talking as if he was Jesus. He was talking about things that would happen to Jesus. Um, he talks about them, you know, casting lots for his clothes. That's what happened to Jesus when he was being crucified. He talks about no, no bones being broken. That's a prophecy about Jesus going to the crucifixion. None of his bones were broken. Um, there's quite a few things. And so another place that we see it is when David goes and actually uses the ephod um, mm -hmm. to communicate with God. So like the breastplate had 12 stones on it, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's also believed that that would light up when people would ask God questions and ask it to the high priest. They would light up and kind of project images onto the wall. And the high priest was able to read those symbols and tell the person what it means, what is God saying and so forth. And so David, who was running from Saul at the time, goes and he talks to the priest and he's like, hey, I'm starving, like I'm really hungry. Um, what do you have to eat? The priests are like, well, we don't really have anything. Uh, we don't have anything for you right now, except the bread that the the shoe bread that's supposed to be given to God. David goes, well, at first they asked David, you know, have you been intimate with a woman? Because that would have made him ceremonially unclean. He's like, no, I haven't been with a woman today. My soldiers haven't been with any women today. We're clean. We're good. They come in. He eats the bread. He also gets the breastplate, sits down with it and begins to ask God um, different questions about if he should go to war, what's going to happen with Saul, different things like that. And God answers him by the ephod. That was not supposed to happen. But that showed that David carried something. Technically, David broke the law. He broke God's law by even doing that. But God gave him a pass because it was a Christophany where he was operating at the time as both priest and king. He was also considered a prophet, prophet, priest, and king. Why was he allowed to do that? Because Jesus would come through his line. Jesus was known as the son of David. So as a Christophany, David was able to manifest those attributes of Jesus and Melchizedek because that is how Christophanies work. And so he was able to embody that prophecy. Uh, he was also, uh, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Um, and it says that his territory, it's believed that his territory was kind of between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, which is very interesting because the Mount of Olives is where Jesus will come back and step foot when every eye sees him. And so it makes perfect sense that um, Melchizedek's territory will be in Jerusalem. Uh, when heaven comes down to earth, it will be known as the new Jerusalem and Jesus will be ruling and reigning there. So that's also how we see the alignment coming into play. Um, Melchizedek, his name actually means king of righteousness. Who else do we know as the king of righteousness? Jesus Christ. And um, emphasis on Melchizedek is added in the New Testament. The New Testament talks about Melchizedek more than the old one does because it applies even more in the New Testament. Now, um, fulfilling the order of Melchizedek, we're almost done, <laughs> but fulfilling the order of Melchizedek, now we're going to talk about how Jesus fulfilled all these things and how it all ties together. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are in... Okay, this is Hebrews. This is Hebrews 8. Uh, and it says, This change has been made very clear since a different priest who was like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed out this when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So this was what David wrote, as we were talking about before, and the prophetic understanding that he had. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without, without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. 
because yeah. of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system for death prevented them from, rem from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the king. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the, the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this from their own sin, their, for their own sins first, and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made, per has been made the perfect high priest forever. So right here... The author of Hebrews is letting us know the flaws of the old system, why the old high priest system didn't work. The high priest had to do sacrifices every day to atone for their own sins because they were human. There's no human in existence that is without sin, that just doesn't sin. So every day they had to basically repent for their own, own sins and then do the same thing for the people. So this was going on and on and it was repetitive. And then you have Jesus who has no sin. So he has no reason to do these sacrifices every day. And that's why we can say that his sacrifice was once and for all. He was both the, the high priest and the sacrifice. This is why he's known as the sacrificial lamb. He is the sacrifice without spot or blemish that God required in the Old Testament. He is the high priest who was without sin that was required in the Old Testament. He is qualified to fulfill both of those roles. And because of that, no other human high priest is needed. But in return, he has turned us into priests. So as priests, we assist the high priest just as in the Old Testament. And so um, something else that I find really interesting is that Jesus actually, we don't, people don't realize this, but Jesus went through the process of basically coming into being brought into the office of high priest um, while he was on earth. So on uh, in the Old Testament, uh, when a father, when the high priest knew that he was getting close to the end of his life, he would begin to prepare his son. Um, to take his place and kind of like the son would kind of be sworn into office in a way, like when you have a new president or someone taking a new important position. And so what they would do is that the, the son would have to go through a mikvah, which was a ceremonial bath. And the Bible talks about, you know, being ceremonially clean. That would be a mikvah. He had to be immersed in water, which represented purification. Um, and then he also had to have oil point poured on him, which showed that he was anointed for the office that he was coming into. And then the father had to, the father would have to basically announce that that was his son and that he was proud of him and that he was bringing him into office. Fast forward, we go into the New Testament. Jesus gets baptized. He has no reason to be baptized because he has no sin, right? Baptism. Mm -hmm is the New Testament version of the mikvah of the Old Testament. So Jesus wow. goes to the mikvah. He's immersed in the water. The Holy mm -hmm. Spirit comes upon him like a dove, which oil represents the Holy Spirit. And then God speaks and says, this is my son in whom I am pleased. That was wow. Jesus being sworn into the office of high priest. Amen. Wow. People just don't realize it, but that's how powerful that was. Jesus didn't have a, Jesus didn't need to be baptized for the same reason that we do. Right. He was doing that as it was almost like a coronation or an ordination mm -hmm. that was actually taking place. And that's why he went through it and he submitted himself to the will of God so that that could be done. He was being brought into the office of high priest or at least the beginning stages of it. Um, where he, now he's fully in it and operating in it. Wow, that's incredible. God is so intentional with everything. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, Jesus brings a new world order. 
I know that sounds really oops. Gee, that sounds really iffy because what we know is the new world order. But it, it literally, he literally brought new order to the world, new order to the world of Israel, um, to the, the, the priest system and things like that. In fact, oh, actually, I'll go over that in a second. Um, but as I was saying, he comes in, he's operating as prophet, priest, and king. So on earth, he was a prophet. Um, after he died and resurrected, he went to heaven and is operating as priest, when he, as high priest. When he comes back, and heaven is on earth, he'll be operating as king. So we see all these three things that are taking, that are going to take, that have or are going to take place. Not from the tribe of Levi. So that, that system got destroyed. It's no longer just, you have to be born into this tribe. Now Jesus has redone things and now we are under the order of Mel, the priestly order of Melchizedek. And then he's grafted us in as priests. Um, you don't have to be born from the tribe of Levi in order to operate as a priest because of Jesus coming to the order of Melchizedek, which does not require genealogy. It just requires commitment and ordination from the high priest, which is Jesus Christ. So once you accept him and you're grafted in, he has called you to be a priest. The Bible says we'll be priests and kings. So right now we operate as priests um, during the millennial reign. We'll operate as kings as well. Um, there will be people for us to rule over. There are, will be people that we have dominion over, things that we're able to do that other people can't. That will be a thing. Um, he establishes a new covenant or new law. Uh, and then the, the something I just find really interesting. So remember we talked about the scarlet, the scarlet thread that was tied on the door and tied on the goats. Um, so it is documented that in 30 AD, that in 30 AD, after because Jesus was crucified and resurrected during the time of atonement, um, what we know as Passover, or some people, you know, people know celebrate Easter, but during that time, um, that is when Jesus was crucified because he was the sacrificial lamb, he was the atonement offering uh, for believers. But so in 30 AD, when that happened. That would the scarlet thread uh, after after thirty AD it never happened again it never turned white again why is that because Jesus God no longer required the sacrifices wow so after that the string on the temple door never turned it never changed colors again wow so God was serious when He was saying that this was a once and for all sacrifice that Jesus was making the scarlet thread never turned again because the sacrifice was no longer needed at least for that time period it's not because it's we're going to go back to animal sacrifices but it's not for sin it's to help well, i'll go into that in a bit but we don't need sa animal sacrifices anymore and so we're brought into the priesthood and jesus establishes a new line of priests which would be us now um, grafting you into the Melchizedek order. It's just a few scriptures I want to show so that everybody can understand who God is calling them to be. According to 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then we have Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I think that people underestimate when God tells us to present him with a sacrifice, I think we underestimate when God talks about us being a sacrifice. When we do that, we are embodying the characteristics of Christ. You are acting as a priest and the sacrifice. You're offering yourself as a sacrifice and you're doing this to get closer to God, which is also a priestly position. And so just as I was talking about David and Melchizedek and Christophanes and things like that, 
we are to embody what Christ is doing. God still requires sacrifices from us, just not animal sacrifices. How do we offer God sacrifices? By fasting. We, we push away the plate and we, we sacrifice food, specifically food in some way, shape, or form. That is one way that you sacrifice. By you, when you crucify your flesh and you choose to say no to ungodly things, you are sacrif you're offering God a sacrifice. You are sacrificing yourself, sacrificing your flesh, crucifying your flesh, presenting it to God, which you can do because you're also a priest. You can present it to the priest, I mean to the high priest as a priest. And this is what God requires of us. He's not telling you to kill a goat or push it off a cliff, or kill a bull. He's simply asking you to crucify your flesh. And for some strange reason, we as believers still think that that's God asking for too much. Despite everything Jesus had to go through, despite the nails, the pain, despite the stuff the high priest had to go through, you know, with the animals and things like that, back in the Old Testament, we, for some weird reason, think that crucifying our flesh is too much, as if Jesus is not worth it, as if he didn't set the example first, as if he didn't show how possible it was. Right. But that's how messed up and limited our thinking becomes when we don't understand things like this mm -hmm. and that's why it's important um i think i have a couple more scriptures for yes okay so hebrews 10 19 through 22 therefore brother since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. One thing I want, a couple of things I want to point out with that. After Jesus, Jesus was crucified and he resurrected, after he did what he did for the three days that he, that he was gone or that he, that he died, um, he mm -hmm. gathered his blood, took it to heaven with him sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven and that is what atoned for our sins forever so remember i told you that aaron and the high priest in the old testament they had to get the blood of that animal that goat that bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and god would accept it jesus did that in heaven he did it he sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven God accepted it, and it was a once-for-all thing. Now we're able to repent for ourselves. We don't have to give sacrifices. We don't have to tell someone what we did and, and do this. Con confession is important, but we don't have to do that for every single thing in order to atone for sins or things like that. Jesus covered that. And so the things that happen in the Old Testament, they still apply. If you look at the wording in the New Testament, these are things things that God required, that he still finds pleasure in, that he still finds joy in, is just in a different way. Um, in Hebrews, it says our hearts were sprinkled. So we don't have to do the mikvahs anymore. We don't have to be ceremonially clean. Our hearts are considered ceremonially clean because of the blood of Jesus. He took care of that. It says that we were able to enter into we were able to enter into holy places with confidence. In the Old Testament, you could not go into the Holy of Holies unless you were a high priest or you were going to die. You were going to drop dead the moment you enter into that curtain. It's a wrap for you. You don't have a choice. If the high priest did not atone for his sins, if he wasn't in right standing with God, he would drop dead. There's a belief that the high priest had to wear bells, okay? And move over. They would be outside listening for these bells because if they heard the bells not ringing and the, there was a rope wrapped around his ankle, they would have to drag his body out um, in, in case he just dropped dead because that's how serious the presence and glory of God is. That's how heavy the weight of his glory is. But in Hebrews 10, it says that we're able to enter into holy places and enter through the curtain. The curtain is the flesh of Jesus Christ. We're able to enter into holy places. We're able to seek God. We're able to enter the spirit realm. We're able to go before the throne of God with confidence because we can go through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is more than more than a prophet. Jesus is more than what all these other religions try to make him seem. He is literally our way into the holy places. Jesus said he is the door. He meant that literally. Jesus is a portal. Jesus is the way, the way, the way to God, the truth, the life. Everything he says he is, we we we, we seem to, to comprehend it at surface level. It's so much deeper than that. He's telling us that he's giving us access to the, the ways of God, to God himself by entering through him. And yet for some strange reason, we still don't want to spend time seeking him. We still don't want to spend time in worship. We still don't want to spend time in prayer. We still look at our phones to see what time it is because the preacher is taking too long. Not even appreciating the fact that Jesus gave us this ability. And then looking at Hebrews 13, through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Hebrews 13, this is New Testament, is telling us. We still have sacrifices to offer God. It tells us through fasting. It tells us through the fruit of our lips. Christians should not be cussing. That That is mm -hmm. um, perverting a sacrifice. When we do all that cussing, we do all that gossiping, and we're backbiting, and we're talking about this person, talking about that person, saying this, saying so we shouldn't be saying. That is a perverted offering. That is a perverted sacrifice. That is an offering to the enemy and not God himself. That is idolatry when you do things like that. This scripture says the fruit of our lips. We tell people about God. We praise him. We say hallelujah. We, we're calling on Yahweh. Different things like that. That is a sacrifice or a offering. That is an offering that we're giving to the Lord. The Lord loves offerings. So we should be keeping. David said he's going to keep a praise on his lips because he understood that that is how he can give sacrifices or offerings to God. And that is the example that we should be following. We should be very aware of our conduct, very aware of our, our speech. Why? Because we are priests. We should be acting like priests. We should be following the standard that was set for priests. God called us to be a holy people, a righteous people, not a lukewarm people, not a compromising people. There is a standard. No, we don't live in the Old Testament. No, we're not. You don't have to be from the tribe of Levi. No, you don't have to experience the same fear that they had back then. But the standard of holiness, we still have to be holy. Why? Because he is holy. And that is what he commanded of us. It's the least we can do since we no longer have to sacrifice animals every single day to cover for our own sin. Amen. It's the least we can do. That's why scripture says it's our reasonable service mm -hmm. to present God with our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is reasonable. It's the least we can do is basically what he's saying. And then um, Malachi 2.7 for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Malachi 2, 7. As priests of God, who serve the high priest, which is Jesus. We should have knowledge. We should have wisdom of the scriptures, of Jesus, of who he is, of the gospels, of the will of God for our lives. The Bible says, study to show yourselves approved. We have to do that. We have to guard our lips. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge. There should be so much information. There should be such a a reverent a reverence that we have for what we allow to leave our mouth even when nobody's looking even when nobody can hear us that reverence should still be there that is what the priests were supposed to have because they knew that if they stepped into that temple or that tabernacle with the, the sin that they were doing in private everybody would know because they would drop dead we have to understand that God will still expose us if he needs to. 
God will still humble us if he needs to. We should still have the fear of God within us as the body and as the church. The fear of God is the beginning of what that means. It's base, like that's foundation. You need the fear of God at basic level just to start acquiring wisdom. And we have to understand who we can and can't share it with. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't spend all your time trying to force people to accept this and that. But also be willing to speak when God is telling you to share the gospel with people. You should know what the gospel is because you are a priest. What kind of priest does not know the God that he or she is a priest for? That's embarrassing. Embarrassing. That is embarrassing to be. And so we have to make sure as priests unto God that we are on top of it. Uh, and then I'm almost at the end. So foreseeing your, your royal priestly future. Um, this is just a few scriptures to show what we will be doing. So, you know, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rapture the church. Uh, or we're going to be caught up. Don't get caught up in the word rapture. I know it's not in the Bible, but the, the concept is it just means to be caught up. Um, but that's going to happen. Everything's going to happen on earth. And then it's going to be a millennial reign. And during that time, we're going to be on the earth. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus. This is what the Bible says about it. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Daniel 7, 27. So this lets us know. It says, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. So these kingdoms on earth that we see that, that's there at the time, they're going to be under us as saints of the most high. We're going to rule over them. We're going to be priests. We're going to have to teach people how to get closer to God, how to worship God, how to be pleasing to God, how to satisfy God. So start practicing now. You guys, start practicing now. Don't wait until then and you don't know anything and you're going to look crazy. Start practicing now. Know who you are. Know whose you are. Understand that, you know, God did call you to be the head and not the tail. You're going to be in dominion during this time, according to Daniel. And then we have Zechariah. Um, Zechariah 14, 19, 19 through 20. Then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship him, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, then the rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will go up and enter in, then the rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots and in the house of the Lord of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take some pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be Canaanite, a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So what this is saying is that during that time, Pete, for one, God is still keeping the feast. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's a sin if you don't keep the feast. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there is a special blessing if you do keep them or if you're up to date on them and you try to do it, you know, as best as you can, there's a blessing connected to that. It's not done away with the feasts are, these are called the Lord's feasts. These are not Jewish feasts. These don't only belong to the Jewish people. These are the Lord's feasts. These are for him. And so even in the future, in the millennial reign, these feasts will still exist and God will expect them to be celebrated. Another thing to know, the Feast of Tabernacles is believed to be Jesus' birthday. Because it says in the Gospels, Jesus was born and tabernacled among us. So more than likely, and my husband talks about this, more than likely, um, this, these are people presenting gifts to Jesus for his birthday. 
And the people who refuse to do it, the nations that refuse, because people are going to be born during that time. Some people won't know God like that. Um, or their families will, but people will be dying, having babies, all this other stuff, kind of like back in the Old Testament where, you know, the, the children of Israel didn't know God as much as the actual, their, their parents and their ancestors and things like that. Um, and so the ones who refuse, God is going to withhold rain from them. There's going to be plagues and things like that. It's almost like we're going back to the beginning. It's like a fresh start in a way. Uh, and during this time, we are going to be priests unto God. We're going to be kings that are ruling over these areas. Sacrifices will continue, not for sin, but as a reminder of the effects that sin has. And as a memorial, in a way, of what Jesus did and what God did and what they went through to save man. And this is going to be a reminder to those during that time on why they should have accepted Jesus and why these things were going on and why Jesus is so important and things like that. So when you really think about it, when God says we're priests, he means it. He's preparing us for the future. This is more than just symbolism. He means it in the most literal way. We will be functioning and operating as priests. Right now, we are to be functioning and operating as priests unto God under the Raya, that was such a Holy Spirit filled teaching. And I'm sure now people will begin to walk as priests, take their holiness and their righteousness before God seriously, because this is something like Mariah said that we're going to be doing, we're supposed to be doing now and that we will do in the future in heaven. So this is an on the priesthood of all believers is an ongoing ministry for believers to live out every single day. Amen. Amen. And Mariah, um, you can put your, if you want to donate to her ministry, I'm going to put the links in the description box as well as her links to contact her in the description box. So just look for that. And thank you. Thank you so much, Mariah. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed this. And I just pray that people are encouraged by the teaching. Amen. All right. We will see you in the next one. I hope Hopefully I can have Mariah on again to talk about something else relating to the priesthood, because this is just a this topic, you know, she could probably even go further in depth, but there has to be a problem at some point. So hopefully I'll have her on again and I will see you all later. God bless. God bless.